proud of Andre. Oh, come on! The, the C lessons I've been giving him. Uh, he's making the most of the opportunity. Come on! Practicing my high pitched scream. I'm not, I'm not gonna do it for you tonight, though. What the hell? You know, I, I, I had a, a, a different lesson for you guys today. I, I figured that we're just kicking off the semester for a lot of us, and I was gonna preach a, a lesson that I've entitled Christianity 101. <laughs> for the existence of God. But, after seeing the spirit of the group tonight, I decided to throw that one out for the time being. And we're going to jump into Ephesians chapter 6. Come back to the next congregation. Come on, Jason! I got my uh, Coke Zero just in the spirit of Kyle. Kyle's gonna be here tonight, so I, I, I got this for him. Love you, Kyle. We love you. Let's go, Ephesians 6. And when they showed that movie in theaters, 
people were passing out. Yes. And they were literally, you can go and watch footage of it on YouTube. They were pulling them out of the theater, and the hallway outside was just, it was alive with people who had passed out from watching the movie. And ever since then, there's this fascination with this struggle between God and the devil, even for people who don't subscribe to an all-powerful God. Because we intrinsically know that there is good and there is evil. That's the premise of the Avengers and every you know, superhero movie you ever think of. That there's right and there's wrong. There's good and there's evil in this world. And here the Bible tells us that we are in the throes of it. Let's look over here in Revelation chapter 12. How did we get here? Verse 7. Come on. Give me an amen when you're there. Hallelujah. You guys are on it today. It says in verse 7. It says, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation, the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, who dwell them, but woe to you, earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he wow. knows that his time is short. You know, here it tells us this is not a fable. No, 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 no. This is not a fable. Mom, no. this is real. This is not allegorical. Preach, please. This, this is, is a book. There is a beyond. You know, I was going to teach apologetics and I was going to go over Newton's it. laws of motion and how it, it, the idea that we got a universe from nothing is ridiculous. Yes. This is what the science community tells you that somehow. Something came from nothing. Oh my God! That's what the geniuses believe, which goes against Newton's laws of motion. One of the Newton's laws of motion is that something doesn't get going unless something has an external force that makes it go. We know this to be true. If this microphone just started to move around and nobody was handling it, what would you say? Supernatural. Yeah. There's something supernatural yeah, going on. That's true. Come on. Another one is the amount of force should be in relation to the effect that it has upon that force. So if I flick this podium and it flew to the back of the auditorium there, you go, wow, you have supernatural powers. Yeah. You just flicked it and it went that far. This is a law of motion. And these laws of motion make it impossible that something came from nothing. And here it tells us what happened before the earth came to be. It says that there was a war in heaven. Satan and his angels, he thought that he could perform a coup d'etat on God, which means he thought that he could overthrow God. Wow. And he was not strong enough. And he was hurled down. You know, it says that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Wow. See, I think a lot of times as disciples, we don't realize how offensive... And offensive to Satan it is what we are doing here on a Friday night. Come on, bro. We just came and we sang some 
songs and it's awesome and we're hoping somebody will make a decision to give their life to God. This is an assault upon the forces of darkness of this world. And we are fighting against the devil. And guess what? He is going to fight back. He fought back, but he was not strong enough. Come on. And he was casted to the earth like a bolt of lightning. Done. And it says, well, and salvation has come, and it's awesome for heaven. The mm. woe to you, earth, because Satan has gone down to you. Come on. If you read in verse 17 of the same chapter, it says, the dragon was enraged at the woman. The woman is to symbolize the people of God. Yeah. And went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey the commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Wow. wow. So Satan's time is short. He's infuriated. Wow. He knows he can't beat God. He tried yeah. that once. Yeah. So what can he do? He can try and destroy his children. Wow. wow. He can hey. hit them where it hurts. And that's by grabbing one soul after another. He knows his time is short. And to take them with them wow. into destruction. It says that Satan leads the whole world. Wow. Damn it. Come on. Damn. That's crazy. Wow. We got to ask ourselves tonight. Okay, this is what the Bible says. Okay. <laughs> All right. I could have done a lesson to really prove to you that the Bible is real. <laughs> I grew up an atheist. I don't subscribe to this because mommy and daddy told me. <laughs> literature? How does this line with ancient artifacts and museums? How does this line with science? How does this line with astrophysics? How does this line with prophecy? I went with testimony. This is no ordinary book. This is all of us. It says that Satan leads the whole world astray. How are we going to overcome him? And how does he do this to us? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's step over here at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Alright now. The man came to preach. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 1. It says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Don't get down when people want to be Christians. <laughs> Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You know, this is something that I love so much about what we do. Come on. Yeah. All we do is we take God's word, <laughs> we show it to them, yeah. and then we call them to do it. Yeah. And then just to make sure that they, they don't like us more than their convictions, we write down all the scriptures and we say, hey, go home, study this out, be a Marian, make sure that this is what the Bible's actually teaching you. If it's not what it's teaching you, Throw it out, or come back and show me how I'm a false teacher. But if this is what God says, you have to do something. All right. All right. Feel that. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot See the light of the gospel, the glory of God, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as servants for Christ's sake. For God, who said that light shine out of darkness, made his light shine into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power 
is from God and not from us. Wow. You know, this scripture is like poetry. It's beautiful. But it tells us the reality of the world we live in. Yeah, come on. It says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. And it says that he is. He has enslaved the mind of unbelievers. And that is my first point for you tonight. How does Satan do it? He enslaves the minds. You know, it's interesting because he doesn't say he blinds the eyes of unbelievers. He says he blinds the minds. <laughs> they just can't quite see it. You know, this is spiritual warfare. We are in an information war. Yeah. We are trying to get the, the truth that can set them free into their hearts. But sadly, we've been programmed our whole lives by every commercial, every music video, every Hollywood movie, what they said in your high school, what your uncles told you, what grandparents told you, what your parents want you to do. We have been hardwired. We've had our minds enslaved. Yeah. Wow. And God is so desperately trying to unplug us from the matrix so that we can see the real world. Yeah. Come on. Come on, you know, Harriet Tubman said, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if they'd only known that they were slaves. Here's the thing. People at this school, they think they're going to get a great job and they're going to live the American dream. And they're going to find out when they're 30 and 40 that, well, the American dream ended up being a nightmare. We don't care how much money they got or if they got Mrs. Wright or Mr. Wright. The divorce rate is at 65% in California. A family that sticks together, that's become a pastime. Yeah. Wow. That's something that our grandparents did. We come from broken families and a broken home and a broken society and a broken world. Oh, and there's no amount of humanitarian work that can fix this. Feeding somebody a meal is not going to fix this, though that's a great thing to do. Building a, a home somewhere in a third world country isn't going to fix this. Come on, Jason. The problem it is not the, the starvation. The problem is the greed that can't keep people starving. This is a spiritual problem with a spiritual solution. Yeah. It starts with us free in our mind. Come on. Come on. You know how? Does Satan blind our minds? He steals our faith. Wow. He steals it. You know, it says in Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. Talk about it. Come on. That's good. And that faith is being sure of what you hope for, certain of what you do not see. How does Satan steal this from us? Let's look over here at Romans 10. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. It says in verse 14, How then can they call on one whom they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? See, that's why we got to plant 30 churches this year. Yeah. And how can they preach unless they're sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Here, it gives us a simple calculus. It says, how can people believe unless they've heard? Right. And how can they hear unless someone's preaching to them? Right. And how can they preach unless we tell them to go? Wow. Wow. And then it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Amen. Wow. See, this is why we've got to plant a church in Akragana. Yeah. yeah. We 
we've got to bring the good news that God is alive and there's a truth that can set them free. And how can they believe that unless we send Quake you there? Because it says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard in the word. See, God gave us this book so that it could produce faith in your life. That's what it's here for. It's not meant for like, wow, I'm really down on my finances. Let me read a psalm. You know, we have a death in the family. Let's look at a proverb or Ecclesiastes. Come on. This is supposed to be something that you're, you're teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in every day. You know, it says in John 20, it says, These things were written down so that you may believe. Yeah. That's the one. You know, we live in a time... You know, people go like, we've lost religion in modern times. Are you crazy? <laughs> we have more religion now than all of this. We see one church in the book of Acts explode into 43,000 different denominations of Christianity. That's 43,000 different ways to follow Jesus, even though he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not unlike the ways. into philosophy. Oh. And whatever Jesus is to you, he is to you, and it's maybe something oh. different to you, and it's something different to him. I mean, hey, I like, I like the baby Jesus. Oh. That's the baby Jesus I subscribe to. And if you like the teenage Jesus, cool. If you like that radical Jesus, fine, but just don't push it on me. Wow. And we turn it into whatever we want. How many of us, listen to this, how many of us grew up going to church? All right, now, so keep your hands up, keep your hands up. All right, now keep your hands up if the people in that church knew and followed the Bible. No, man. Yeah, we know we're in church now. All right, we get it. We're going to put your hands up. About 75% of us grew up going to church. And for most of us, that was kind of like our heritage passed down from our parents. It was like, hey, I, I, I'm Catholic. Why? Because I'm Irish. <laughs> My spiritual convictions were formed like this. When I was maybe 9 or 10 years old, one of the neighborhood kids asked me, what kind of church do you go to? I said, I have no idea. So I ran home and I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what kind of church do we go to? What religion are we? He said, we're Episcopalian. Episcopalian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Now we're thinking, we're trying to say we're Episcopalian. Proud. <laughs> and that was my level of conviction. And many of us were the same way. Why? Why did we not have a real faith? Why did we not have a biblical faith? Because we didn't know the Bible. Yeah. It says faith comes from hearing the message. Yeah. You know, there's a great story in Samuel 13 where there was no swords in Israel except for two. That the Philistines took, they killed all the blacksmiths so nobody could make any swords. And now in the New Testament, Ephesians 6 scripture, it says that the word of God is a sword. Yeah. And this is the time we live in. There's no swords. A lot of people go to church. Nobody knows how to use this thing right here. But I'm looking at a group of men and women tonight. Yeah. Satan is trying to enslave our minds. There's only one way to unplug. And that's to get into this thing right here. And find the truth that can set you free. You know, my second point for you tonight is, it says that he veiled the truth. He veiled it. You know, you, we're going to have a wedding here. You know, goes up to 
this up to Charvel, it'll be in about three weeks. But, uh, we're going to have a wedding here, and Leslie may come down. We're going to have a wedding here this week with the two of us. And many times the bride comes down with a veil. And that's that it, you can see her face, but you can't really quite see it clearly. And it says, this is what Satan has done to the truth. Wow. He's bailed. Do you see it? Like, I, yeah, I mean, I read the Bible. I kind of know, like, hey, what do you believe about somebody? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I know some things about it. I, I, I got a pretty good handle on it. But I, I don't really quite know it. I can't really see it. What is the time we live in? Turn with me over to Amos chapter 8. <laughs> Preach that. Okay. Amos chapter 8, on, verse 11. Oh, this is good. This is good. It says, The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord. Amos 8, verse 11. When I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Time we live in. It, 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 all of us were, were well fed here. You had In and Out before you came. And some of us, whose metabolism hasn't leveled out yet, you may get In and Out on your way out. There you go. There you go. Can't live like that. It's not, it's not where I'm at. But here it says there's a different starvation that's happening. There's a different malnourishment that is happening. It's a starvation of hearing the words of God. Wow. And sadly, many of us grew up and go into church and we lost the Bible of all places in the church. Wow. And here it says, man, we need to be fed God's word. So that we can see it clearly. So that we can be healthy spiritually. You know, it says in 2 Timothy 4. It says, for time has come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers. They'll just say what they want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. In Timothy, Paul was talking about the future church. He's saying, hey, this is what's going to happen. One day people won't want to hear that there's only one real way to follow Jesus. That you've got to be a real disciple of him. And the Bible has to be your standard. You can't just bend it and break it and make it to where you want it to be. And if, if Jesus is going to be your Savior, then he has to be your Lord as well. Wow. Instead, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers that'll just say what they want to hear. Yep. And now we have 43,000 of them. Wow. A lot of people look at this, they go, wow, all these churches and all this craziness. How can this be real? How can this be valid if there's all these inroads and people pointing fingers and saying we're the right ones and you're the wrong ones and all this? For me, it doesn't devaluate Christianity, it validates yes. Christianity. Wow. Just pretend with me for a minute that you believe what I'm talking about here tonight. Pretend that there is a God and there is a devil. And this is the truth that actually can set you free. And you're the devil. Wouldn't you try and muddy this truth so much that are people going to know if they're coming or going? That their spiritual convictions are just like a heritage passed down from their parents and they never check or challenge it? They don't even know it's in the world? starving but they don't even know it wow wouldn't you create that type of environment that they think they're safe but you actually have them wow it's exactly what Satan wow, wow, wow. oh, yeah come on bro it's true you know, if you're here tonight and you're, you're going you know what i went to church my whole life i can't say i know the bible 
you have an incredible opportunity. Right. 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 Yeah. All of us are here not because mom and dad raised us Reach in a church. No, oh, there's a couple of us here. We're here because somebody at one point in our lives reached out to us. They met us in a grocery store on campus or at a workplace. And they said, hey, have you ever studied the Bible? And I was like, absolutely not. And we got to a point, many of us ran initially. We're like, I don't want to do this. A lot of times we blew these people off. Absolutely. Some of us started to study, and then we, we, we saw, like, the Bible started to show us some things, then we ran away from it. And then we eventually came to a point where we, we saw what the scriptures actually taught. It was set forth plainly. And they didn't just communicate theology to us. They didn't just tell us that, you know, change the way you think. They called us to do something about it. These people weren't, like, full-time ministry people. For the most part, they were just average Joe Christians in the pews. Yeah. And they set it forth, and God worked in our lives. Somehow, I had the humility to actually do it, and I got baptized on November 15, 1998. I was that before many of you were born. <laughs> And here I am, 24 years later, I'm more certain that this is God's word than I was even when I got into those bars. But the challenge is simple, study the Bible. Stop believing the lies of this world. This world is torn apart. You don't believe me? Just turn on the news tonight. See what's happening. It doesn't matter if you get a degree from USC. It doesn't matter if, if you get a, a, a six-figure job or you even hit it big and become rich one day. It doesn't matter. The rich and the poor are killing themselves almost equally. This world is destroyed. It is enslaved. And tonight you have a chance to be set free. Satan is counting on one final thing. At the end of the day, what he's counting on is your sin. Yep. Wow. And that's my last point for you tonight. The power of sin. Let's turn over here to Genesis 4. Come on, Jason! Pick it up in verse 1. It says, it says, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions in some of the, from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. The power of sin. I mean, sin is so powerful. So powerful. Right. Even right now. Sin is working in many here trying to deceive them and talk them out of this message. Even right now, some of us are going, I don't think this is for me, though. I'm pretty sure it's for him. Even right now, some are going, like, I don't know. I don't know about all this. I'm pretty sure I, it's just as long as I'm a good person. Understands. God understands, you know, my life. No, we don't. And 
And we've taken God and we've turned him into an American. Oh! I'm telling you, I think some of us, you go and you pray to God and you go, God, and you think you're talking to an American. Who understands that it's just not practical to be in a pure relationship today. Oh! century. Come on, Jesus. I mean, please. Let me tell you what. I had my first kiss at the altar. And Gavin and Bella are going to get married here another week, and they're going to have their first kiss at the altar. You know, oh, okay, like, you grew up like a choir boy in the church. No, I've been in the world. destruction. In fact, we think we can reap, reap an awesome life. Wow. And let me tell you what, let me tell you right now, I'm a prophet here. It's great to have a prophet here. But I'm a prophet here. Let me tell you, right now, I'm going to tell you your family history. Here's your family history. Drug addiction, divorce, abuse, incarceration, Alcoholism, yeah. all of it. <laughs> Bitterness, broken relationships, family members that don't want to talk to each other, poverty, anger, the whole bit. Some of us are we've got strange relationships with our parents, our nephews, our aunts, our uncles, our siblings. 
its total destruction. Wow. It's the power of sin. Wow. You know, this is, at the end of the day, what Satan's going to count on. Wow. Come on. Come on, bro. You know, let me tell you what just happened today. Come on. Come on. Come on. Today, 1,000 people were sexually assaulted today. That's what happened today. Today, 2,400 people got divorced. Today, 40,000 children were abandoned. Today, 20,000 children will be abused. Today, 2,200 people will commit suicide. And today, 500,000 of them tried and were unsuccessful. That's just what happened today. And you know what that's become? It's the scariest thing of all. Normal. Yeah. Dang. Wow. This is wow. normal. So we, we think that this is how it was supposed to be. Wow. This is not what God wanted. Preach, bro. This is not how we planned for it to be. We're supposed to be in the garden with God right now. Yes. No shame. I mean, I'm not trying to be weird, but they weren't wearing any clothes. And there's like no weirdness. It's like, what's up, dude? <laughs> hey, what are you doing today? I don't know. We're going to hang out, you know? Like, cool. No shame. No weirdness. That's, that was supposed to be absolutely pure. Yeah. And sin came into the world, and now we're like, that's just a crazy. Like, you feel uncomfortable even talking about it. <laughs> that's the power of sin. Let's close out here in Ephesians 2. Come on, Jason. Come on, I'm going to step down. I don't want to take up any more in time here. Preach, bro. It says in verse 1. Come on, brother. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Here it tells us the reality of our world. It says, as for you, you were dead when you were living. Wow. Damn. You know, there's another type of movies that we're just so fascinated with, zombies. and it's zombie yeah. apocalypse movies. Yeah. And what is a zombie apocalypse? It's people who are dead, but actually alive. And you want to know where the zombie apocalypse is at? Just go right outside. Yeah. It's happening right outside. Just take... Take a step back and watch the people. Yeah. It's a zombie apocalypse. It's people who are dead, but they're living. And all they're trying to do is, is, is gratify the, the cravings of their sinful nature. It says, like us, at one point we were with them. And we're objects of God's wrath. You know, I love zombie movies. The one of my favorites is Warm Bodies. Yeah. You, ever seen this one? Yeah. you know, so, oh, this one's cool. cool because it's from the point of view of the zombie. Yeah. And he's going around and he's he's just uh, eating people and he's kind of thinking a little bit. And he kind of has his zombie friends. And then eventually he meets a girl. And meeting that girl in that interaction with somebody who is alive, he starts to become human again. It's kind of like what's happening to Charvel right now. Something's happening. I can't quite explain it. But as she interacts with him, he starts to become more and more alive. And then there's this final scene of it. Where she's, she falls in love with this zombie oh. who's becoming human again, but her father is obviously very scared of it, and they're up on this, this tower, and they fall out of the tower, hugging each other, and they fall into this pool, and when they, cut, when they hit the pool, he gets shot. 
caught and blood comes out into the water. And at that point, she goes, look, Dad, he's alive. He's bleeding. And I'm telling you, the whole thing's an allegory for Christianity. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because he then falls out. He falls into the water where the blood of Jesus is. He gets baptized. And that's when he raises the blood. You know, God is working in an incredible way. We're about to see three souls do the very same thing. You know, tonight we looked at how Satan has enslaved the world. How can we overcome? Well, it says in Colossians, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. That's right. I would call you to take hold of the words of Jesus, who said, in this life you'll have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He overcame the world. We can overcome our sins. Because tonight, maybe for you, the veil was removed. And I hope that every single one of us, as we walk out of these doors, has truly seen the spiritual world. I love you guys.